In this lecture, we'll go over biomes, which are broad scale vegetation types that are influenced mostly by climate and also biodiversity, some of the causes of biodiversity and how the biodiversity changes with changing ecological factors. Let's start with kind of the largest scale um, category of regions of the world, and that would be the biosphere. It's all the areas throughout Earth where living organisms are found. It includes the, the lower atmosphere, the air, the land and soil, water, including marine habitats and fresh water, and that's about it. It doesn't include the Earth's mantle, nothing lives down there except maybe some scary dragons that can uh, handle the lava, but it, not really, of course. So it's just that area that's designated by that diagram. That's the biosphere. Within the biosphere, kind of the next category down of um, regions of the world that share similar characteristics would be a biome. Those are areas that, on Earth that have a similar climate and environmental, other environmental factors like the physical environment. And they tend to support similar types of uh, plants and some animals too. For example, like the desert biome. That is a word that can um, describe lots of different desert areas throughout the world. They're all dry, hot, thin, not really good soil, like thin soils and they have vegetation that is more or less similar. So within biomes, there's many different habitats because biomes are a big scale category. Um, so there can be lots of different types of habitats within the biomes, but they all still fall within that basic biome definition. So there's like a lot of different types of desert habitats, but they're all still the desert biome. Also, let's define biotic and abiotic. Biotic means living, living things. The biotic environment means all the organisms. The abiotic environment means everything else, the stuff in our environment that's not alive, like water, rocks, air, all that, minerals, things like that. Together, they make uh, an ecosystem, um, and that's what those two are. Here you can see how the major ecosystems and biomes there in the different colors are distributed throughout the earth. In general, altitude and latitude, which affect the temperature and precipitation, are the things that determine what type of biome will be expressed at that site. And what I think is maybe some interesting background information that you might already know about why temperature and precipitation differ at various latitudes, how it's warmer and wetter near the equator, cooler and drier as you go towards either pole. It's about the position of the earth, its tilt um, that it has on it from its axis as it moves around the sun and its year-long journey and how that changes the different amount of solar radiation that hits the various parts. Like you can see um, the yellow arrows are kind of highlighting almost like the temperate zones. They're not quite, they're moved away from the equator enough to where you see that Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn. In those zones, um, the, right around there the, is where you have temperate zones, kind of like California or a lot of the United States, where it's not really wet and really hot, but not super cold either. And once again, global climate patterns dictated mostly by the mean temperature and precipitation. Here you're seeing mean annual temperatures, and clearly it's warmer near the equator. And that affects, um, there are other factors too, but it affects the climate, and that affects what types of plants and animals are there, and the, the diversity, and cultures too.
Marine ecosystems can be further broken down into these categories, a beach, deep sea, coral reefs, kelp forest, estuary, where the rivers meet the sea, intertidal zone, where the waves break, seagrass beds, which are usually under a, not more than a few meters in depth, and mangroves that are really important for coastal um, stability. This slide is just a kind of a takeoff on looking at those different types of marine ecosystems. Look at the mangroves, for example, how valuable they are for a number of reasons. Um, looking at the value per hectare, which is a couple of acres, um, you know, look on the y-axis and then comparing a mangrove, which is a natural occurring um, subtropical and tropical coastal type of um, ecosystem and how important it is for fisheries. Um, that's where a lot of the fish populations reproduce and feed and grow and um, coastal protection. It slows down and dissipates the energy of ocean action. It, so it really protects the coast from erosion, which can cause problems in the marine environment too with all that sediment. Um, important for timber and non-timber products. There's some importance there. So it has a high value. If you look at a shrimp farm, which is located in a similar type of area in um, shallow coastal areas, it makes money. So it has value to humans um, because of the profits brought in from the shrimp that are raised and sold. But there are a lot of costs related to the pollution it creates. Um, it, it displaces or takes out and damages um, native ecosystems like mangroves and replaces it with these farms. So there's a lot of cost to it. So when you look at those two things, um, you can see how much more valuable it is to uh, protect a mangrove ecosystem rather than replace it with a shrimp farm. It's even economically, is, is, uh, sometimes economics are used to argue for the protection of pristine or intact ecosystems rather than changing them over to something that like agriculture or in this case, a shrimp farm. Let's look at four different definitions of biodiversity there on the right. There's variability. It, sometimes it depends on the use of that word, what, it, you know, who's talking about biodiversity and what they're going to use that, that metric for. Um, if you look on the left, it's talking about the types of biodiversity. There's genetic diversity. That's a type of biodiversity. Within one population, you have different genetics, just like humans all look different. We have lots of different uh, genotypes within the human population and in this vole population. Um, go up a little bigger in scale and there's species, different species in an ecosystem. That's diversity of species, not genetics. And then even a uh, larger scale, um, you can have different ecosystem diversity um, or community diversity. Pictures just a little mock up of like on the left is a redwood forest ecosystem. On the right looks like some kind of like oak woodland ecosystem. So there's uh, there's diversity of even ecosystems in that example, and that happens all the time, especially in coastal areas. So to re reiterate those three: genetic diversity is a type of biodiversity, species diversity, the next level up, ecosystem diversity, the next level up. And now functional diversity, it's not really the highest level, it's just another form of diversity. What is functional diversity? It means sometimes uh, different species play the same role or the same, they have the same function in an ecosystem, like a large overstory tree that shades and creates cool shady environment. Um, that could be different species are serving the same function or predators like large um, fish and sharks in the ocean are both predators of other fish, so they have a functional similarity. So um, the more you 
if they don't have a similar function, then that would be more diversity of function. And that is uh, supposed to stabilize an ecosystem as well as species diversity does. So they're all important and just depends what kind of questions you're asking and what you're looking at. Why does biodiversity matter? Well, if you look at it from an ecological point of view, uh, many, many studies have shown that a more biodiverse ecosystem is more stable. Another way put, probably more accurate, is it's more resilient. If a disturbance occurs, um, if that's pollution or a huge storm or an earthquake or disease, a more biodiverse ecosystem will bounce back better. Um, and it's not so different than human ecosystem or you know populations. The more diversity we have in our human communities, you have more genetic diversity and more ability to handle changes, um, even more ideas that, to solve problems. It's just kind of a basic thing that uh, when there's more species and more ways of doing things and more functions, that something, some organism in that community will survive and know how to handle a big um, perturbation or disturbance or problem. Um, so that's why it, it's important. And humans think it's important because we want our ecosystems to stay stable because they're the ones that support us. Okay, so we've established that diversity is good. Genetic diversity is one of the types of diversity. What influences genetic diversity? Mutations can create new, um, new genetic combinations of things. Alleles are a portion of a gene. Um, random mating through different individuals creates more genetic diversity. Random fertilization, so which egg and which sperm get together because each of those is unique too genetically. And then recombination between homologous chromosomes during meiosis. So there's copies of chromosomes um, in, in, especially in humans, but in other individuals too, plants and animals, there's more than one copy. And when the sperm and the eggs are made and then the sperm and the egg get together, there's more genetic um, mixing up that happens that creates even more diversity during that process. And of course, genetic diversity and all those factors that influence it are the underlying driver for evolution. It's a mechanism of how evolution occurs. So evolution is occurring in a population. There's different genetics of different individuals in the population of one species. Those um, types of genetic changes can happen through mutations, gene flows, non-random mating, genetic drift, and selection. Certain individuals do better than others. All of those lead to a population whose genetic changes and is directional changing towards more and better adapted to that environment so it re it survives those those species survive and reproduce better as time goes on we'll go into a little more detail about each of these five in the next slide besides mutations gene flow can also be a potent factor of introducing genetic diversity into a population Gene flow is when genetic material from one population of a species is transferred to another population of that same species through migration. Um, if those two populations have been fairly isolated for a, a amount of time, their, their genetics will be different. And then the flow in between will introduce new genetic material or alleles and their frequencies can, um, can be different. And as the diagram shows, and that's how the diversity can increase through gene flow. Genetic drift is similar to gene flow, except though it's not migration that creates more diversity in a, a population of a species, but it's random chance that causes this. It could be that some gene variants, or let's say some individuals that have certain genetics don't do as well, and there's maybe a heat wave or some kind of extreme event and some of those genes are taken out. That would be the random uh, instance that creates uh, different types of diversity 
within that population. The bottleneck effect is another way that you can get genetic variation occurring in a population. Let's say you've got an original population with a bunch of different types of genetics of individuals in that population. So they're all the same species, like even though those are all different colored marbles in the bottle, they're all representing the same species with different genetics. There could be an event, a bottlenecking event, meaning something happens, maybe a disease sweeps through that population and only a few survive or a few uh, migrate to another place. So only the surviving population are the only ones left. That's They've gone through this bottleneck where a lot were taken out, so a lot of the diversity goes away and it's left with the surviving population. That's how it, it can negatively affect a population. Um, one good example is the northern elephant seals and they have uh, their genetic diversity has been reduced because of, of a bottleneck that humans inflicted on them by um, hunting them down to almost 20, only 20 individuals at the end of the 19th century. So it went down from tens of thousands to only 20. So the genetics of the populations we have today, which have rebounded significantly, are still just from those 20 individuals. So that was a bottleneck event which affected the genetics and the diversity of that species. The founder effect is strictly when we have a few individuals from a population migrating or moving to a whole new area that is not does not have that species. So they're the colonizers and because only a few leave, then the genetics are different in that new population than in the old. This slide is just reiterating and giving you a little graphic about functional diversity. Uh, a functional group is a group of species, different species that perform the same functional role in the ecosystem. For example, feeding in the same way. Here you've got a shark um, eating a bunch of small fish, but also big fish eating small fish, so they have a similar role. Um, great white sharks and bluefin tuna are considered both apex predators, and that makes them um, both function similarly in the ecosystem. Some other drivers, we've mentioned this before, of biodiversity, the equatorial polar gradient, higher diversity at the tropics because of the warm, moist climate, and there's a very strong correlation between the solar energy input and water availability, that's the temperature and the moisture, and species richness, as shown here. Um, the first graph is tree species richness over um, evapotranspiration. So that's the amount of moisture in the soil and moving through the plants. And um, as that increases, species richness increases. The bottom graph is vertebrate species richness and um, also the same thing. So that increases too, but you see it plateau out with the animals. Evapotranspiration is the highest in areas of high temperatures and rainfall. The equator again. Think of evapotranspiration as, it's kind of like precipitation, but it's also just water moving through the plants and vegetation back into the atmosphere, back and forth. So a lot of moisture movement and availability to organisms. And as I've said earlier, cultural diversity roughly follows biodiversity patterns. Um, the areas where you have more moisture and warmer temperatures, you tend to have more diverse cultural groups too. And the areas of the world that are more biologically diverse are also in general more culturally diverse. Those are two very connected things. So indigenous communities and land-based cultures that have long histories of understanding and working with the landscape to procure the foods and resources they need um, are um, a vast source of knowledge about how to take care of those ecosystems in sustainable manners. So that information, the traditional knowledge of indigenous people is critical to, um, to value and honor and document. So um, we can use that for land management skills today. This map shows biodiversity hotspots throughout the world. What is a biodiversity hotspot? They're just places in the world where there's a high level of species diversity. Usually lots of ende endemic species. Those are ones that are only found in that one place in the entire world. And also a significant number of endangered species, threatened species, sensitive species. Um, but in general, these places too, 
they are biodiversity hotspots because of partly what we've been talking about, the climate, and also um, geographically and geologically too. There's a lot of diversity in the topography and in the geology, which lends itself to more different types of plants and animals that live there. But uh, that's what those are. This slide shows the Coral Triangle, which is a very diverse uh, area of the ocean, our oceans. Um, so it's the epicenter of biodiversity for coral reefs. Um, it comprises a large area. Um, this is kind of like right above Australia area. Um, and it um, has the highest diversity of coral and marine life in the world. Lots of people live there too, um, but it is a very large tourism generator this area, so visit if you can. Now we're going to look at the influences uh, of humans on biodiversity and how humans are accelerating the loss of biodiversity. Not a fun topic, but I'm sure you've heard of it before. But sprinkled within here too is some hope of how we can um, protect biodiversity that we still have. There has been in past years some controversy over whether the current high extinction rate of species or loss of biodiversity um, is a natural thing or is it human caused. Um, scientists consider this the sixth great extinction. We've had lots of extinction events in that we know about as humans in the history of the earth shown here in these different colored boxes and different time periods of geologic time. Um, it looks like the rate that we're losing species now um, ranks it up there with one of the top six extinction periods and mostly because of an overabundance of humans and human activities, which is causing the demise of lots of different species. If you look at kind of like the background rate of species loss, what we've been seeing for the past couple hundred years, so many, it's normal for species to um, new species to come on board and some species to go extinct, but that background rate is much, much lower than this period of time that we're in now, and we're seeing much higher rate due to human activities. So this does look like it's human caused. One of the biggest loss of species is due to habitat fragmentation and habitat loss. So humans are encroaching, humans communities and buildings and uh, whatever we do to the land and agriculture that changes it from a natural habitat, that loss of habitat just decreasing in the amount of habitat is causing biodiversity loss and fragmentation. Little, lots of little small bits of natural areas like you see in that bottom left picture, um, those have a much lower ability to support a diverse species than a big area. So if it's fragmented, it weakens it and there's less species. And if there's just, of course, less overall area, same thing. Also with human activity and travel and trade, our species are taken out of their natural habitat where they have checks and balances by other species, predators, etc., that keep them kind of at lower numbers. And if they're taken to a new area, and they do well there, and there aren't any natural predators, they become invasive species. It's introduced to a place and it becomes overpopulated and harms its new environment. I'm looking at those pigs in the right center, like pigs that were introduced to Santa Cruz Island here off the coast in Santa Barbara, and those for hunting, and those pigs took over and decimated the native, native vegetation. Um, in around 2007, the Park Service started a massive, very expensive um, pr program to get rid of all the wild pigs, which had really ruined the habitat there. And um, they did it, and the habitat is slowly bouncing back now. Of course, humans are also introducing lots of pollution that natural habitats are not used to, have not evolved with, and cannot survive often. Another problem and another factor that's uh, negatively influencing biodiversity across our planet. And arguably, there are just too many people. Um, more and more and more people 
uh, is a huge reason why there's habitat fragmentation, loss, pollution, all of those things are increasing and invasive, invasive species too, increasing. So um, our population is just so big and it's getting bigger faster. So um, there's just less room for species and we, we're losing them because of that. In an effort to feed all of these 8.1 billion people on earth, there is overfishing and overhunting. So animals and fish are hunted far beyond what their populations can handle and rebound from. So they're weakened and some of them spiral down into extinction. But humans are not unaware of all these problems and as I am a human explaining them to you and they're in books, we know about this. People are working on this to try to reduce the negative effects of humans on our planet and biodiversity. Um, so that's a start. That's where it starts with is with awareness and some action. And I think as the biodiversity continues to go down, it's hopefully at some point we will value it so much more highly that we'll do even more drastic things to save it. Interestingly, pet uh, and me medicine trade, so the trade around the world for pets, zoo animals, and medicines from plants and animals, mostly animals, really does contribute to a negative effect on biodiversity. A lot of these creatures that are traded and sold for different reasons, uh, for zoos, aquariums, pets, um, sometimes for meat, they are um, species that are sensitive or endangered or low populations. And so this further weakens them. Um, also traded for preserved parts. Um, I know like in, in the rhinoceros's tusks shown in that picture on the upper left, um, not the far left, but the little box kind of like what looks like by a bowl of soup. You know, those rhinoceroses have been killed just for their tusks because they're thought to be a, an aphrodisiac to ingest that. Um, things like that that become medicinal or pseudo-medicinal and traded for really weakens those populations. Like I said, people are aware of these issues, scientists and biologists, um, and there have been conventions like the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, people striving to do everything they can to bring awareness and uh, management of species and protection of species so we don't see the biodiversity rate continue to increase. Um, there, the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered um, Species, um, CITES or CITES, is a treaty of um, international and that was made to protect endangered plants and animals. So that was created and adopted a long time ago um, and it's still around and it's helping protect these species. Of course, the United States has had the Endangered Species Act since 1973, signed into law by Richard Nixon, who was later ousted. Um, but he did sign some really good environmental laws into, um, into, into uh, enactment. And this is one of them. And it protects the endangered species and the habitats on which they depend, which is great. We can, um, we can use the Endangered Species Act and it has been used to come up against other laws like the mining law, um, where businesses and governments have um, kind of a right to log and mine. And, but this, if it, it, it somehow um, rubs up against the Endangered Species Act and um, trying to protect species, it has a lot of strength. And so a lot of species have been protected and saved. Probably like the bald eagle, the brown pelican, the gray wolf, Lots of species have become on, put on the endangered species list, um, been given protection and rebounded and then taken off the list because their populations have, um, have gone back up. It's really hopeful news. DDT was a chemical used as a pesticide just on mosquitoes and other agricultural insect pests um, back before the 60s uh, or before the 70s in which it was outlawed, but that DDT also created, um, got into the ocean, the marine ecosystem, and then fish would accumulate that chemical in their body and then 
um, fishing birds like pelicans and um, bald eagles that eat fish exclusively, they would get that DDT into their system. And then when they laid eggs, the eggshells were too thin as a result of that chemical in their body and their eggs would um, crack and crush before the chicks were ready to come out. So that was a big problem. And that has been outlawed partly um, really started by Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. Um, who she was predicting correctly that if we did not get rid of chemicals like this, um, most of the songbirds that we really value hearing them in the spring and other times, their shells would be weakened and we would have rapidly declining populations of those songbirds. A local example, um, the condor. Uh, that that uh, coastal California is part of their habitat. But in the 1800s, settlers put out poisons for like coyotes and mountain lions. But the birds, these condors ate them, ate the poison and died. And then later DDT in, in their, in the ecosystem, weakened their eggs too. And so they became almost extinct. Um, but they, you can see the graph here, if they went down to 1987, all remaining wild condors captured for breeding programs. There were very few. I don't know the exact numbers, but they have rebounded quite a bit. Um, although there are still problems with them, we have the, the condor sanctuary back in the backcountry here behind Santa Barbara in Los Padres National Forest. And this is considered a success, at least staving off their extinction. And we'll end with just the definition of four different terms used in biodiversity and ecosystem discussions. Keystone species is a species on which other species in an ecosystem largely depend. So if that species was removed, the ecosystem would change drastically or collapse, as some would say. Indicator species, an animal or plant that can be used to kind of tell us the condition of that habitat something that's very sensitive and it will show a sign if something is changing or going wrong. It shows that sign first, kind of like the canary in the coal mine metaphor. Um, umbrella species is one whose conservation is expected to confer protection to a large number of naturally occurring species. So that's a species that uh, protects and supports a lot of other species and we want to focus our uh, conservation efforts on all of these types of species because they have a big effect on others. Flagship species is uh, one selected to act as an ambassador or a symbol for that habitat or campaign that people can, can rally around. There you go.